Hey, it's David Weiner, the director of In Search of Darkness and In Search of Darkness Part 2. You are listening to The Graveyard Show. To the graveyard. And welcome to another edition of the Graveyard Show podcast. I am your caretaker, and the graveyard is open. Wrapping up my two part interview with David Weiner, the director of the horror documentary In Search of Darkness, A Journey into Iconic 80s Horror. Now, if you missed part one of the interview, all you have to do is just go back one podcast to GYS Tombstone number 21. Uh, it's kind of the, uh, the sort of the setup interview. Uh, David and I discussed his career as an assistant director, uh, how he became uh, the executive editor of Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine, uh, as well as working... Uh, as the senior editor of ET Online for about 13 years. David's also a two-time Rondo Hatton Award winner and is also uh, a contributing writer uh, to The Hollywood Reporter as well as The LA Weekly. Now, uh, we also discussed... Uh, In Search of Darkness Part 2 on that podcast uh, because there was a time-limited offer that was expiring at midnight on Halloween. So obviously I wanted to include uh, information about Part 2 in my October podcast. That offer was the ability to pre-order In Search of Darkness Part 2 and uh, with that pre-order came a bunch of really cool stuff for Part 2 such as uh, getting your name in the credits, uh, obviously uh, selecting either a DVD or a Blu-ray copy of part two, uh, a digital download of part one, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Now, unlike In Search of Darkness part one, part two is not scheduled to be streaming on Shudder at all. So if you have Shudder and you're just going to wait for uh, for the film to come on there, uh, as of right now, there are no plans to have In Search of Darkness part two on Shudder right now. Um, I also learned that there are also no plans for this film to be released on VOD as well. Um, so uh, outside the pre-order right now, there is um, there is no information regarding uh, this film making it to uh, physical media as well. So if you missed the pre-order in October, um, yeah, sorry. Uh, as of right now, that was the only way really to see this movie. Now, do not lose hope. Fear not, my friends. Um, If you go to the film's website, 80shorrordoc.com, so that's 80shorrordoc.com, you can see what uh, was available in the pre-order. You can see all the the different things that they're offering. But uh, what's great is that you can also sign up for the newsletter and as information for the film comes out, you will get that information sent to your email directly. So make sure you check that out. It's 80shorrordoc.com, 80shorrordoc.com. There we go. <laughs> I can spell. Um, now, if you want to get in contact with this program, uh, the email address is gyspodcast at gmail.com. gyspodcast at gmail.com. Uh, you can send me your thoughts, comments, and also if you're uh, a part of the horror community and you have something to promote, please don't hesitate to reach out as well. After the interview, I will have some rare news and notes about some upcoming horror films, as well as some information uh, regarding a new science fiction film trailer you can catch online. I know a little sci-fi info here inside the graveyard, a rarity as well. Um, Plus, I'm going to let you know uh, what my plans are for my next few podcasts coming up in December, so stay tuned for that. Okay, uh, it's time to get back to my interview with David Weiner. Now, normally when my guest arrives, you hear their grave being dug. But if you look right over there, no, 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 right over there. Yeah, right there. Uh, If you look over there, you'll notice that this grave has already been dug. That's because I'm just going to be picking up right where I left off from the previous podcast as David and I get into the meat of the film In Search of Darkness a journey into iconic 80s horror. Okay, it's time to get back to work. So let's talk about the movie itself. 
around the five minute mark in the movie, you get right into the pop culture and politics of the 1980s. Uh, did you feel that that would create a solid foundation for the rest of the documentary? I think it's important to frame the era contextually. Uh, I didn't want to dive too much into either pop culture or politics because that's a whole movie in itself. But I think um, I think there, you know, I, I sort of wrestled with, you know, do people think the psychology of horror and do people think the pop culture and the, the politics of the era, um, you know, how much do they need to know? And And I think the toughest element of putting a film like this together is you want to present uh, kind of a case study. And so you need all the pieces. And so while some might be a little more obvious, uh, I think if you don't include it, there are going to be parts of the audience where this is all brand new to them. And it, it doesn't quite gel, co you know, coherently. If you're missing certain pieces, assuming people already know that. So while it might be a bit didactic at parts, I think overall it's absolutely necessary to kind of create some some era context for why the horror, you know, first of all, why do people love watching horror? Second of all, you know, what was the 80s about? Was it just Rubik's Cubes and MTV or what was there more to it? And and by the way, a lot of people don't talk about MTV the way they used to back then. And so they not they might not realize that that was a huge influence, as you mentioned earlier just on, on movies and pop culture and entertainment, and it had an absolute ripple effect across all, all platforms of media. So you gotta sort of create that, that foundation and then dive into the movies. So when you, when you talk about movies reflecting the era, whether overtly or more subtly or in terms of perception, you need to understand why. And what's so funny about MTV is that you could make the argument that it, it was the reason why we have WrestleMania now, because that was basically yeah. the whole, that became the whole catalyst for everything that came, that it was the domino effect, which I don't think a lot of people remember or know. <laughs> um, well, you know, not to, not to dwell too much on it, but I mean, you know, MTV was vilified by a lot of people too. They're just like, oh, you know, kids' attention spans, you yeah. know, or why, why aren't people using their imagination? It all has to be you know, a visual medium now? Why do we have to sit and watch music when we can listen to it? You know, mm -hmm. it's, it, it sort of challenged the norms and uh, we, we take it all for granted now, but it sounds a bit antiquated, but that was all new and, and, and rebellious and revolutionary at the time. Yeah. I mean, it was the first time, I mean, there were bands that I didn't even know what they looked like. You turn on MTV and you'd see the song and you'd see the band. You'd be like, oh, okay. Because <laughs> it wasn't, you know, it's like, unless you were a fan of the band, you, you didn't know. And you know, it was, it was, it, it was really interesting. Like, uh, you know, seeing concerts and just stuff. I mean, I was, you know, and sometimes it was better not knowing what the bands <laughs> yeah, looked like. Sometimes. Exactly. I won't name names. <laughs> Base for radio, right? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to get us back on track on the movie. Cause I took us off with MTV. So I apologize for that. <laughs> Uh, and we could, I could spend an you know entire show just talking about that. But um, so so after after you get into um, the politics and the fads at the time, you start off. You go in chronological order. Nineteen eighty, obviously being the first uh, year you, you you profile. And what I what I mm -hmm. thought was really interesting was that um, instead of going with an obvious slasher film from the time like Friday the Thirteenth, the first two films that you profiled were actually ghost stories. You you started with the fog and then the changeling. After that, so um, yeah. was there any method to that madness? Well, there, I, I went over all sorts of thought processes. You know, there, you know, the mind edits everything, and what you see is what you get. But there, when there are so many ways to approach all this material, you know, uh, it could be it could be by subgenre, it could be by theme, it could be by director, it could be by distributor. There's a million ways to to look at all, all this stuff. Robin Block always wanted. He's like, let's go year by year, movie by movie. And while you just can't do that with every movie because it's just too much, um, I decided to take a handful of films that represented a solid cross-section of what was available and literally just put them in order theatrically uh, in terms of their, their, their uh, North American theatrical release. And I figured that's kind of the way they rolled out, you know, and you could play the trailer to get people 
uh, uh, whet their appetite, give them a taste of what the trailers were like back then, but also to sort of set the stage of what this movie was. And um, I figured that was the best way to go about it. So it just happened to be that way, you know, that you got like the changeling and the fog first. And it's still the best, you know, two, two really uh, ideal ways of starting this movie because it shows two different things. It shows for the changing, for example, uh, for the fog example, for example, you have people, you know, uh, uh, John Carpenter and Tom Atkins, who were who made this movie, talking about their movie. Um, but then right next to that, you have the Changeling, where I don't have anyone from the Changeling, but I have the two stars of the Animator who just loved that, Barbara Crampton and Jeffrey Combs, who were just fans of that movie, talking about why they loved it and why it was influential to them. And that kind of sets the tone for what this movie is all about. You know, it's not only people talking about their own movies, but it's people from other movies and other parts of the genre, you know, who are just fans and knowledgeable about it. Well, I was happy to see that you mentioned one of uh, one of the movies I always kind of go back to, Fade to Black. I think it's one of those movies <laughs> that gets kind of lost in that time period. Um, and ironically enough, uh, Shudder just added it. Uh, well, not just, but Shudder added it. Yeah, uh, yeah, they added it to yeah, their roster, and people yeah. are discovering it for the first time. And uh, sorry to jump on. The, oh no, you haven't asked the question yet. But it's like um, it, it was. It was rewarding to see some people say oh i heard about that or i saw that on on in search of darkness and now i get to see it so um i like that you not only spotlighted uh the films of the time but that you also spoke about things that were like sort of an offshoot of the of the era i guess or the fads of the era um obviously vhs home video uh the birth of direct uh to video films and video artwork uh, which were all so important for that time period because it gave um, it gave exposure to films that would normally not be able to get um, uh, exposure uh, through the Hollywood system. Um, you mentioned a movie called The Ripper, which I totally forgot about, but I remember seeing at the time, <laughs> right. which was with Tom Savini <laughs> playing Jack the Ripper. Yeah, and that's he's the running, one running put, around yeah, playing Jack the Ripper. That's yeah. the one where the guy puts the ring on, right? It's like Jack the Ripper's ring. <laughs> he puts it on, and then Tom Savini <laughs> right. shows up as Jack the Ripper. <laughs> um, but what I found interesting was how um, the one description was that, uh, I can't remember who it was who said it, but they rented, I think they were seeing a movie, a film, and instead they were seeing a movie that was was done on video and that it that it made the movie feel cheap. Yeah, that was Phil Noble Jr., the editor-in-chief of Fangoria. Yeah, there, I mean, the, the, you didn't know what you were going to get, especially if you hadn't heard of it before and you're responding just to the box art. So there was a bit of a gamble because it didn't matter how... You paid the same thing for every single tape. So you could get, like, a blockbuster that cost, you know, millions of dollars to make, or you could get... The Ripper <laughs> with Tom Savini, yeah. which to him was was a disappointment. Although the way you describe it, you know, I think that at least they made up with some imagination in terms of the storytelling. And you know, anytime you have Tom Savini having, you know, he just he just relishes acting acting opportunities because he's he had to sort of battle his way into getting acting roles because he was the you know the effects master and people saw him as that first and foremost. Um, yeah, it, you know, I, I think the thing about the, the the video store experience that we all reminisce about now is really kind of amusing to me because, you know, back then it was just a, it was just the necessity. You went out, you and you 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 browse the movies and you pick something or a couple things, you know, if you wanted to stack up a, a pile for the week or the weekend. But it was just sort of the way you did things because that, that was the only sort of outlet to do it other than cable or just snapping the TV channels to see what was on. Yeah. Um, but we look back at it now incredibly fondly for a very obvious reason now. <laughs> we don't have video stores anymore. I mean, there there there's still are some around, but it's not as pervasive as it used to be. And uh, I think the tactile element of picking up the box, looking at the front and the back, physically thinking about it while it's, while it's physically in your hand, there's, there's a certain appeal to that whole process of, of anticipation and hoping that something's going to be good and also committing even if the movie isn't that good because you rented it and that's all you've got. Whereas today, you know, you could just change the channel and streaming and flipping through all the, 
you know, the titles, arguably, it's the same thing, but there, it's just a different feeling and it's a different process. And I think, uh, you know, we all get nostalgic for, you know, Blockbuster and, and, and the mom and pop stores, but the reality that I think a lot of people sort of gloss over now is that Blockbuster was kind of the evil corporate entity that wanted to uh, censor a lot of films for a more family-friendly uh, uh, perception of themselves. And so if you really wanted the, the down and dirty stuff, you had to go to the mom and pop places to get it, or you had to go to three zigzag across town mom and pop places until you got the one that you wanted. Yeah, and, it was uh, like a treasure that, that hunt. That whole experience... Yeah, that whole experience made it into more of an adventure than it is now. Yeah, it's like it's like going into Barnes and Noble and looking around, spending time. You know, I mean, I remember you know back in the '90s, walking around Blockbuster videos and spending a day. Uh, not Blockbuster, I'm sorry, uh, Barnes and Noble, spending a day in there, just kind of you know going through books and just kind of seeing what's there. Or it's like going into a record store. You know, you, you go through, you, you get an album, you come home. You look at the liner notes. You have the artwork. I mean, that's the that's the one thing about the '80s uh, video artwork. That and and movie posters. Um, I mean, talk about works of art. I mean, they, they kind of that kind of got lost when we got into the '90s, and it became more about like sort of like you know, it almost looked like a uh, like a prof like an acting um, re- like a resume. Yeah, look, yeah, it looks like a head. Yeah, headshot. Uh, well, I, you're talking about the the art on the posters yeah. specifically. Heather Langen Heather Langenkamp of Nightmare on Elm Street kind of laments that fact you know she talks about how how spectacular all of the nightmare on elm street art was with the same artist consistently doing all the posters and then you look at these things with the 90s where it's just the actor's face and and a, a logo with a font yeah <laughs> you know i know it's... and you have no idea and, and like you know i'm just, this is the same way with like the, the james bond posters you know like as they became more and more just about daniel craig's face yeah you know, or or, uh, or Pierce Brosnan's face. I was just like, come on, where's the spectacular explosions, artwork, and really good, really evocative stuff that made you want to dive into the adventure on the poster itself, with anticipation. Yeah. Now, one of the films early on, of course, the infamous Scanners, <laughs> um, <laughs> certainly one of the most shocking and well-known moments in film history. Uh, I can tell you right now, because uh, I, I mentioned this because I want to share a story from my time back in the day when I was young uh-huh. and it was on HBO and I don't know if you remember but um, back in the day in cable TV they used to come up with like a little lock box that you could connect to your cable box for, for like HBO and it was sort of like a parental control thing and right. if, and and so HBO was connected to that so if, if you're if your parents didn't want you to watch it, they could lock it, you know, turn the lock, take the lock with them or whatever, and you couldn't get HBO. Well, I remember one night, I was, I must have been like a Saturday night or something. My folks and I were watching Scanners. We had no idea what this is. My mom was a big movie movie junkie, so she watched it anything. So we were sitting, we would watch it, and when that scene happened, I'll never forget, as soon as that head exploded, she got up, she took the key, <laughs> she put it in the lock, <laughs> turned it, and was like, we're done. And I'm like, well, how am I getting punished for this? You wanted to watch uh, it just as much as I did. <laughs> but that's my that's my initial memory of Scanners. <laughs> those are indelible memories, because a lot of times it has more to do than the movie itself, but the situation around the movie. Movie that makes it such a memorable film. So when you think about that film and you look back at it, you know we're not we're not all these movies, Scanners and everything else. Uh, you're not necessarily dissecting the movie itself. You're you're uh, you're evoking these memories of of what you weren't allowed to see or what you shouldn't have seen or just how what how it affected you when a man's head just absolutely exploded with, with you know <laughs> guts <Yeah>. everywhere. <laughs> You know, it's like that that affects you in in certain ways in terms of, you know, one, maybe there's revulsion, but two, there's also the fascination. You know, how did they do that? How did they make this happen so convincingly, you know? And there, that sort of begins the the journey of discovery about uh, the filmmaking process to to many, very much for me. Yeah. 
And it says a lot too about practical effects, right? I mean, they, they leave their mark. That's the kind of stuff that you remember. You remember, you know, the head exploding in scanners. On the, on the walls, on the ceiling, yeah. everywhere. Yeah. You know, you remember the throat slashing in Friday in the first Friday the Thirteenth that that you that you talk about in the film. You remember, you know, the transformations of the werewolves. I mean, you know, it, it, what's amazing to me is in 1981 you had these these movies that came out with incredible effects. You had scanners, you had the howling, you had the burning, and you had American Werewolf in London. All four movies coming out in 1981 and I mean you talk about like indelible effect on like those of us that lived through it the first time but what it would do after that I mean when you talk about werewolf transformations and the debate between which one was considered quote unquote better I mean obviously they're both incredible but you know do you prefer Mm -hmm. The Howling or do you prefer American Werewolf in London and it's incredible because it's like well I mean they're both insane and yet, you know, you still look at them and you go like, they, they, but they're different. And I mean, it's incredible. 1981. Well, that, that, that era, sorry, that, that, that year is very much uh, set the tone for the rest of the decade. Because you have to remember that uh, filmmakers as audience members, you know, sat in the theater and they watched Joe Dante's The Howling or John Landis's The American World from London. And they just thought to the horrify the 13th, Sean S. Cunningham, you know, and Tom Savini's work. You, you just, they, they just said to themselves, oh, my God, you can do that? I can build a story around that. I can make a movie around that just to have that or a variation of that. And that really sort of affected the trajectory of the creativity uh, and, and the amount of the volume of movies that were made in, in, in the years to follow based on the influence of, of just those early two years. Then you go from those Hollywood type movies, right, the Hollywood films, to the more independent film like Evil Dead, which comes out not too long after that, which, you know, talking about like watching movies at your friend's house and stuff. I remember when I saw that film uh, with my friend on video the first time, it was like on a Friday afternoon. And that movie scared the hell out of us, especially when they first walked <laughs> up to the cabin and the and the bench is hitting the, the the cabin, and it's like I'm like, what what am I watching? Like this is so incredibly it, effective. It goes to show you that you don't need a lot of money to have an effective scare. You know? Sure, uh, all you need is a concept, and sometimes the lower the budget, the craftier the film. You know, Sam yeah. Raimi and his you know all the filmmakers. Uh, that is sometimes more effective than a, a high budget than The Shining, you know. Yeah, well, it's funny because I mean, Joe Bob had mentioned in your movie about how Joe Bob Briggs had mentioned about the shaking camera and how they had how they created the, instead of having <laughs> right. a steady cam, they had the, you know the, the, the camera. The shaky cam is better than the <laughs> steady cam. <laughs> yes, <laughs> and it is. It's incredible how how effective. Um, that was, and so, again, something that you were not used to seeing at the time. Just like in The Shining, how they how they had the steady cam. Uh, work in that and going down the hallways. I mean, you would talk about two very different movies all within a couple of years of each other. Uh, but again, you start seeing how technology is starting to be used in that time period as now it's just commonplace. And it's interesting to watch, watch j- just briefly on that, you know, the evolution of filmmaking itself and just the craft of filmmaking and, and, and the different ways that you could tell a story, whether it's because of budget limitations or uh, uh, just creative uh, choreography of acting and camera and setting and all that stuff like that. Uh, there were so many different avenues that horror took in the 80s, and that's why it's worth uh, examining, especially as a student of film. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because you know, we just talked about like the video uh, home video uh, experience in terms of going to a video store and finding like some of those taboo movies and, and stuff that you just would not find anywhere else. Then you, you go to the other side, which is like with Poltergeist. So Poltergeist was considered a safe horror movie, and Joe Bob had said uh, it's safe for people in the suburbs to see, which is very interesting. <laughs> So you have these two very different, right? You talk about like a 180 degree swing here. Um, but I am glad that he and McGarris did say that, that it, Toby Hooper directed this film because of these, these rumors out there that it was actually Steven Spielberg who ghost directed it, no pun intended. I mean, I remember, the, yeah, back then when, when the, I remember when that came out, it, it wasn't too long after that, that people said, yeah, well, Toby Hooper's the director, but it was really Steven Spielberg. And you know, it was, it was, this is before the internet was out and everybody was talking about this, you know. Um, so, boy, poor Toby Hooper. And, and it was important for me to, to get someone who really knew the material. And, and Mick Garris was there. He was on the set of Poltergeist, so he should know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so, 
one one of the real great things about when I when I screened In Search of Darkness that we we, we debuted it at Beyond Fest in Hollywood and we, we showed it in two parts and I remember during intermission uh, this gentleman came up to me and he said, David, I, I want to thank you uh, for telling the right story about Toby Hooper and Poltergeist because Toby was my friend and uh, I think it's really important that people know the, the truth about it and that he, you know, he did. This was his movie. He did direct it. And uh, he thanked me for that. And I just thought that was, it was just very touching to me because, you know, gosh, you know, you make a great movie that everybody loves and everyone just decides to deprive you of it because of, you know, Spielberg's name. That, that's got to be tough for your career. Yeah. Well, I, the other thing, too, is that's like if anybody was paying attention, I mean, Life Force was a couple of years away. And I mean, it's like Life Force, you know, had a very similar tone that poltergeist had it's like and you look at it and you're like well yeah, yeah i mean it's like uh, i know it's very bizarre um <laughs> very strange um one of the interesting things that you did was you used uh occasional intercuts of the siskel and ebert show which i think uh well our younger listeners here won't won't know what we're talking about gene siskel roger ebert had a weekly show uh that was in syndication where they would review, review mm-hmm. movies and um it was called that the movies actually and um it was really interesting that you uh selected pieces from their show in the film <laughs> so how, how how did you how did you go about that well, I just laugh because they they end up being more of a punchline than anything else. I, 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 <laughs> I, I wanted I, I wanted to include them because they were a very important part of that era because people would would they, they their thumbs up or thumbs down uh, really kind of ruled the roost in, in it was almost like a Roman thumbs up and thumbs down when it came to the movies. They had they they had a lot of sway and influence, um, and uh, notoriously did not. Uh, respect and understand horror, uh, pr- you know, collectively at first. Uh, I think there there were pieces that they respected and understood. I, I, I did. I don't want to, you know, just de- 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 declare that they just didn't get it because they, you know, oftentimes one did and one didn't. Uh, um, but it was very important for me to sort of integrate that to sort of give a, a, a era perspective of the type of reviews that were going uh, against horror at the time. And we all, we all kind of look at the, back at something like um, uh, The Thing, for example, uh, and we think of it as a, an absolute classic, you know. And so I just love the moment where, you know, you have Ebert saying that this is the barf bag movie of the summer. Yeah. <laughs> but then you- Looking at him like, what? Yeah. You know, this is, come on, this is pretty good. Even, you know, um, and you only have snippets of it. So, you, you know, if you really want to hear all the things that they had to say, in all fairness, you really need to sort of, you know, track that down on YouTube and so on and so forth. But, um, uh, you know, like for every one of those, you had Roger Ebert talking about how Motel Hell was, was arguably brilliant. Um, so, I, I think it was important just to to pepper those throughout, just to sort of create a little broader context. One of the um, fads, or one of the gimmicks, let's let's call it that. Uh, one of the gimmicks of the '80s was the return of 3D. Um, I, I, what's interesting is I don't remember the movies Rottweiler and Parasite um, in 3D. Uh, but obviously, uh, Friday 3D, uh, Amityville 3D, Jaws 3D. Um, I was glad to see that you, I mean, it's not like you could ignore it because it was very popular at that point in time, but again, very yeah. limited in scope as well. A lot of those movies didn't get a very wide release also, uh, like the you know, Rottweiler uh-huh. and Parasite. I, I, I don't remember, my having been there, I remember Parasite. Uh, I don't remember Rottweiler. I mean, I knew I knew of the movie, but I don't remember ever seeing ads for it. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas Friday, Friday, uh, Friday, Amityville, and Jaws 3Ds were were in every single newspaper saying "Go go 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 go," and those were uh, franchises at that point. So they were much better known. But I, I enjoy seeing, you know, uh, Eric Kurland is, is great in that because he's, he's an absolute authority. He, he has his own 3D museum in Los Angeles. And, um, and uh, so he really knows his stuff. And it was really fun because he brought his bag of goodies where he had, you know, kind of a show and tell of the, you know, press kits and, and the printed glasses they would make for each movies. And he could go into detail as to which kind of glasses and what type of, you know, stereoscopic 
you know, choices were made for all these movies. But, you know, the, 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 the crux of it is, is 3D kind of rears its head every, every couple of decades. Did it in the 50s, did it in the 80s, it did it in the 20 teens, I think, yeah. is when it came back again. Yep. Um, but you also notice that it's all but gone. Right. So it kind of comes and goes. It kind of comes and goes. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of fun. Listen, I want to be optimistic about all these things, but I want to create a little context to it. And I think the reality of 3D is that, you know, I think Andre Gower puts it best. He's like, I always was excited to see what, you know, what 3D had to offer. And I'm still waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's one of those you know, interesting... I think, I think, yeah, it's 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 kind of one of those interesting gimmicks that I think when it's done well, it's it's good. I feel like it's more about the experience of it as opposed to things flying at you. I, I never, like, to me, it was kind of like, oh, okay, you know, back then it was like, oh, okay, I'm gonna go see this movie, and well, it's like Friday 3D, right? You have like the guy with the yo-yo, and like you know, it's just kind of right, like, right. huh? Like, well, hey, I don't. Hey, hey. <laughs> Each their own. I, I I'm kind of in the Phil Noble camp. You know, it's like if I'm going to sit down for a 3D movie, I want things to fly at my face. Yeah. Why not? That's, that's what I'm paying the extra money. Yeah, you I know, get putting you. on the glasses. <laughs> you know? I, I totally hear but, you. <laughs> but you know, like when Peter Jackson did it, you know, for uh, you know his. Uh, was it the third Lord of the Rings movie? And now it's all blending together. Uh, you know, where he 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 changed the frame rate. Uh, and so your 3D process was was very different, and a lot of people complained that it felt more like a, you know, a video than film. Yeah. Um, but but the one thing I will credit uh, to that process when he changed the frame rate was uh, the the biggest problem with 3D is that your eyes adjust very quickly. So unless you're taking your glasses off and on throughout the movie. Uh, your eyes adjust within a minute or two, and it's no longer 3D anymore, really. Um, and so the process that Peter Jackson was using uh, had a, sort of a certain staying power. So there was an immersive element to it. And, and if anything, the appeal to me for those movies that he did was, I felt like I was on the set while this was all happening. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you yeah. Know? yeah. And, and, and even though it, it, it was less cinematic because you need that sort of cinematic grain to provide a a barrier between you and the screen where even though it might be in an immersive tale, it's still cinematic, you know, for lack of a better descriptive mm -hmm. word. Um, you lost that cinematic feel, but I, I kind of felt like at least the 3D stayed. So, you know, you win one thing, you lose another. Certainly the 80s was the decade of Stephen King. You had The Shining, uh, Christine, Children of the Corn, Firestarter, Maximum Overdrive, Cujo on and on and on. Um, it was certainly the decade of King. Um, I did not know that John Carpenter was supposed to direct Firestarter, but did uh, did not get the film, or I guess, I, I don't know if he was fired or just, because I don't think they did anything. He said, he what, said. Was, he, he was said fired. He, he said, I was fired. Oh, so they were <laughs> in So they were in the himself. throes of pre-production then, so they were moving on that. That's really... Oh, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. How, how did you find uh, yeah, out about was, that? Uh, well, doing research, you know, you read about something like that, and then when you get to sit with John Carpenter, you get to confirm, A, is that true? B, what happened? Um, you know, but you got to be diplomatic about it because he yeah. lost his job. But the great thing about sitting down with John Carpenter is that he's a straight shooter, and he's, he'll, he'll just, he, he can be a bit self-effacing. And, uh, you know, we think of him as our master, but he's just like, well, this didn't work and this didn't do well. And I wanted to do this, but I didn't have the budget, all that kind of stuff. And, you know, with Firestarter, he's like, yeah, we, we wanted to do Firestarter, but, uh, you know, it just, uh, the thing bombed. And so I lost my job. I, I, I know all of us out there that are fans would, would I just trying to imagine what that movie would have been like if he had done it, we, but he did get to do Christine. Um, and, uh, I think Christine. And I'm a huge fan of Christine. I love Christine. Yeah, it's been a while since I've seen it. I'm, I watched it a lot back in the early days when it was, uh, I think it was in heavy rotation on HBO, and I remember watching that quite a bit. I have to go back and revisit that because, um, you know, it's it's interesting. Like I remember liking it but not loving it, but you know, it's kind of like what how I felt with Day of the Dead. Uh, ironically enough, from the right around well a couple years later, Day of the Dead for me mm -hmm. was one of those movies where I, I saw it and I was kind of like, all right, you know. 
the ending is great. And then I revisited it like years later and I was like, wow, this is a really solid movie that I think just gets oh, yeah. lost in the trilogy because you have the you know, night, which is brilliant and dawn, which is brilliant. And then day, which kind of had to live up to that. And I think it does. It's well, just a very different and darker film. I think that's the thing. Day of the Dead was not the other films. You know, it goes in a different direction. It takes its time. The setting is very different. Uh, the message is, is, is very different. And so a lot of people brought, uh, you know, a huge, you know, set of baggage of expectations to see that film. And it turned out to be not what they expected. So they walked away disappointed. But I think, again, like you said, coming back to it years later, you realize it's just, it's, it's, it's rich with material and performances. Yeah. Um, and the same, same thing with, you know, with, with Christine, for me, I, I just loved it from the get-go. Uh, I just think it's, it's a really well-crafted film and um, it's just brilliant beginning to end. I've always loved it. Yeah, I'm going to have to go back and revisit that. Sticking with the King uh, theme here, I don't think there's anything more definitive 1980s than a movie being known more for its director being high on cocaine than the, the actual <laughs> movie itself and obviously i'm referring to stephen king and his own directing job uh, on maximum overdrive and, and and self and self proclaimed I, yeah. I i couldn't put that in there unless he said it himself yeah no it's very yeah it's very well documented he's he's very upfront about that <laughs> I mean, I don't think you get anything more 80s than maybe having Scarface with his <laughs> face flat, yeah, exactly. you know, and the Coke on the desk. I mean, you know, it's just like, OK, it was the 80s, man. It was the 80s. Um, you do approach the topic of the final girl. One of the interesting things I found was that some actresses like the term final girl. Some didn't like the term final girl. So did you get a lot of pushback on that or was it sort of like, or was it just a few of the actresses that were kind of like, yeah, you know, it's okay, but it's not, I, I'm not a big fan. Yeah, of it, it, I, I would say, I would say it was a mixed bag, but you know, for, for the ones who, you know, some people are, are fine with like a screen queen label and that kind of stuff, but it gets a little tiring. It gets mm -hmm. a little tiring. And, and final girl is, is a term that came, you know, much later. But it, it sort of defines, uh, in you know, a positive way, how horror was was instrumental in in sort of making women uh, who were always early on perceived to be victimized and arguably still were, but they were getting the comeuppance. They were they were surviving. They were winning. They were get, making it to the end as the final girl. Um, but because because it came became such a well known term associated with the with not only the genre, but that era, you know, when someone like Heather Langenkamp pushes back and says, you know, I'm an equal, I'm looking for equal opportunity ass kicking, you know, and I, I look mm -hmm. forward to a day where it's not about gender, it's just about the character. Yeah, uh, it's important to share that perspective. I liked uh, Kelly Morani's uh, description. She said. <laughs> Was it about Final Girl? She said, back in my day, we used to call that the star, <laughs> which is true. Right. It's like, yeah, you, you can't argue there. <laughs> well, all that stuff, you know, having Barbara Crampton, Kelly Maroney, you know, talking about uh, the necessary evils of, of sex and nudity in these movies and how, you know, sometimes it was a statement. Sometimes it was just to get people to, you know. Uh, pay for their their ticket or their rental, mm -hmm. you know, and put it on the box art or the poster. Or just that was just uh, it was part of the formula. Um, it, the reality is, is there were a lot of people who didn't want to do it, but they felt com pressured or compelled to do it. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, and I and my biggest you know my biggest challenge coming up to talking with Barbara Crampton about Reanimators. That's that's a extremely memorable scene that she's in where she's extremely vulnerable and and to this day that movie is absolutely shocking maybe even more so mm -hmm. um you know when you see what goes down in that movie yeah. and you know I, I i would it was important to me to talk to her about that and just get her take on it and you know it's not black and white it's not like oh i didn't want to do it and they forced me it's not i wanted to do it because the script was great it was sort of like you know well the rest is good. I'll just sort of get through this part. And when they did do it, they were they were absolute professionals, and I felt very comfortable and safe. So looking back on it, it's absolutely fine. But it's not like a, a cut and dry answer. It's a little more complicated because she, you know, she knew that this was an opportunity for her, 
And if she said no because of the scene, uh, which the previous uh, uh, performer who was cast before her, I think that person's mom saw the script and said, you are not making this movie. <laughs> and so she <laughs> kind of came in. She swooped in and got the part. And, and you know, she was just like, you know, so many uh, uh, roles came her way and many people like her requiring them to get nude or have be in a sexual situation and at a certain point a job's a job and if you want to be an actor and move your your career forward you can't say no to everything based on that principle so you have to have your own set of rules and rationalizations to allow yourself to move forward and you know every every genre has that and every especially when you you're in the more indie route of things and uh i think it's an interesting conversation to have What's interesting to me is that when you talk about the final girl, I think um, one of the things that got missed during that time period was flipping it around and instead of having the main killer being a man, having it a woman. And I think Halloween 4 missed that boat, ending on Jamie succeeding Michael and -hmm. then kind of erasing that in the next film. I think they could have really changed Halloween if they made Jamie, if they jump, you know, they could have done a 10 year jump or something in the next film and made her the new Michael. I think that would have really changed that franchise forever. Well, I wish the, the franchise had cha- changed after Halloween three when, and become an anthology. Yes, <laughs> and I then, agree. And, you know, had, and then they could have had two Halloween uh, franchises. They could have had the anthology franchise, and they could have had the Michael Myers franchise. Yeah, and and it could have gone that way if they had marketed Halloween three correctly, um, but they didn't, and so the rest is history. Yeah, but, certainly. You know, there's certainly lots, those of, lots of what it. ifs. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly those of us that are fans of that film. I know, I know, on um, Joe Bob Darcy, the male girl is a big fan of it. Trying to get that on, <laughs> on the last <laughs> drive in quite a bit. Um, but I always find myself going back to that film. I don't know. It's 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 an okay movie, but I just I just enjoy it. It's just fun. Um, which Are you I talking think about Halloween three, four or three 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 yeah. Halloween four. I remember when that came out, and I stood in line for an hour or so in the rain. That's how much I wanted to see Halloween four. I really liked Halloween four. I think it's. I think there's some really good moments in Halloween four too. Um, namely, when Donald Pleasance and the preacher are in the truck. That's my. That might be my favorite scene in in the whole film, where they're kind of talking, and it's like they're kind of mirrors of each other. Uh, it's just I don't know. There's something about that. Whenever I see that scene on TV, I stop and I have to watch it. It's just one of those really nice well, moments. Good. Yeah. Well, and, and this this speaks very much to you know, especially when you get into the, the the later sequels of franchises and things like that. This is where the true horror fans uh, they get to stand their ground and discuss why they love something and why it's important to them. And you know, while one person might say you know Halloween Four, who cared about anything after Halloween One, you know, which was great, but everything was a lot of diminishing returns and confusion. Um, you know, there, there's still an equal amount of people who say I loved it because of this, and this is I wish it had done that, and um, it's important to you, and, and you have a memory, you, you have a sense memory that you can associate with this movie that means more than just the movie itself, and a lot of it has to do with your expectations and how much you love the franchise, and so these are all you know great little nuggets that that carry. Uh, give 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 nuance and, and, and deeper levels to the whole experience. Well, David, I think I'm going to end it on that note. So, well, because I could go on and on and on with your documentary. I'm, I, I really, <laughs> I've, I've watched it twice. I'm probably going to watch it a bunch more times. Uh, I'm a huge fan of it. So, if anybody wants to follow you online, is there any social media? Yeah, I'm pretty active on social media. I'm, I'm probably most active on Twitter. Uh, my Twitter handle is at Tiki Ambassador. Uh, and I also have a, a pop culture website, sort of genre pop culture, with a lot of my interviews uh, from from famous monsters and Entertainment Tonight and other stuff as well, and uh, just my musings. And uh, but my my feed on on that's a, it came from blog dot com, but if you go to social media on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, it's at it came from blog. David Weiner, the director of the horror documentary In Search of Darkness. A journey into iconic 80s horror. Uh, this has just been tremendous and something that I've been looking forward to for quite a while. So thank you uh, for coming in and talking about your film. David, when part two comes out, let's do this again. I'd love to have you back. Thank you so much for joining me on the program. Thank you so much. It's an absolute pleasure chatting with you. 
And as I put this interview to rest, I once again would love to thank David for taking the time to join me here inside the graveyard to discuss his film. Uh, I really uh, look forward to having him back on the program to discuss part two. Uh, I know that there are some things from this film that I did not discuss, some topics uh, left on the table. Uh, I realized that there was only so much time uh, that I could not only devote to interviewing him, but as well as how many podcasts I could put together for this film. I could, like I said before, I could have done five on this and probably not cover the whole thing. So uh, the good news is that the next time I speak with David, uh, I'll get a chance to hit him up on some of those uh, questions that I had regarding part one. And again, if you are interested in learning more about In Search of Darkness Part 2, you can go to the website 80shorrordoc.com, 80shorrordoc.com for more information. And again, uh, regarding um, the release date and other information about the film, just sign up for the newsletter right there on that website, and you will get that information sent to you via email. All right, well, it's time for some rare news and notes about some upcoming films. This is something I used to do back in the day on my first run of the show, except I used to do that for like an hour. <laughs> it was terrible. <laughs> I have no problems admitting that. It was learning. It was a learning process back in those days. Um, but uh, yes, I do have some information regarding some science fiction film, uh, a science fiction film, I should say, um, and some horror films. So Let's hit up the sci-fi film first. Um, on YouTube, there is a trailer that you can catch for a film called Skylines. Uh, that's S-K-Y-L-I-N, the number three, and S, Skylines. Um, there, uh, there is a trailer uploaded. Uh, it's starring uh, Lindsay Morgan, uh, Jonathan Howard, uh, Rona Mitra, uh, James Cosmo, and a whole host of others. The film uh, is written and directed by Liam O'Donnell. And the synopsis... When a virus threatens to turn Earth-dwelling, friendly alien hybrids against humans, Captain Rose Corley, played by Lindsay Morgan, must lead a team of elite soldiers on a mission to the alien's world in order to save what's left of humanity. Uh, it will be in select theaters and on demand coming up in December, December 18th to be exact, of 2020. It is a sci-fi action film. So check that out. If you're uh, listening to the program right now on YouTube, on my YouTube channel, uh, I already devoted a link uh, to that as well. So you just click on that and off you go. All right. Turning back to horror. Uh, this is ironic uh, because I was just reading about this on the Shudder uh, weekly email. They were talking about Irish horror. Well, here's another one. Irish horror film. Uh, this film is uh, called The Cellar and uh, it is in the works. It's in pre-production, I believe right now. Uh, we have um, this film starring Elisha Cuthbert and uh, Owen Mackin. Well, they will both be starring in this film. Uh, the film, The Cellar, is uh, from the uh, critically acclaimed Irish writer-director Brendan Muldowney. Uh, his previous film, Pilgrimage, uh, which starred uh, Tom Holland and John Bernthal, uh, premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival. The, uh, the Cellar tells the story of uh, Kira Woods, who is played by Cuthbert, whose uh, daughter mysteriously vanishes in the seller of their new house in the country. Uh, Kira soon discovers there is an ancient and powerful entity controlling their home that she will have to face or risk losing her family's souls forever. And cut. I think that was a pretty good read, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, so there you go. Keep a lookout for that. Uh, the seller. And uh, it's coming your way. Well, some point in 2021, I would assume. In other horror news, uh, the L.A.-based uh, Dark Star Pictures has acquired the North American distribution rights to the acclaimed backwoods horror title, Honeydew. This acquisition marks the first release uh, in an exciting new collaboration with leading horror entity Bloody Disgusting. I think we all know who Bloody Disgusting is out there in the world of internet horror reporting. Uh, the festival hit features the acting debut of Sawyer Spielberg, son of director Steven Spielberg. I think we've all heard of him before. Uh, alongside Malin Barr and Barbara Killingsley. Now, uh, Honeydew has been called by Nerdist a hallucinogenic nightmare of a movie. Uh, this film tells the story of a young couple, uh, played by Spielberg and Barr, who are forced to seek shelter in the home of an aging farmer and her peculiar son, when they suddenly begin having strange cravings and hallucinations taking them down a rabbit hole of the bizarre. Uh, as of right now, Dark Star and Bloody Disgusting are planning a theatrical release for March of 2021 with a VOD digital release and DVD to follow in April. 
And finally, IFC Midnight presents Hunter Hunter, starring uh, Devin Sawa, Nick Stahl, Camille Sullivan, and Summer Howell. The film is written and directed by Sean Linden. It'll be in select theaters and on digital and on demand December 18th, 2020. So there you have it. And then again, if you're watching this on the YouTube channel, um, I will have links for the different films uh, that were provided, as well as, uh, well, you'll see the posters for these as I've given descriptions of these as well. Speaking of the YouTube channel, if you have not gone over there to check it out, uh, check out youtube.com uh, Graveyard Show Podcast. Coming up in 2021, I am going to be putting together some original content for the YouTube channel. What that is, I'm kind of playing around with some ideas, but uh, just stay tuned for that. So if you have not subscribed to the Graveyard Show Podcast YouTube channel, you may want to think about doing that because, again, in 2021, there's going to be just exclusive material for YouTube uh, that I'm going to be putting together for that. So I just want to put that out there now. Uh, Looking ahead to December. So um, the holiday months kind of get quiet around here inside the graveyard. I want to kind of start relaxing, enjoying the holidays. I know uh, any guests that I would try to pursue would probably be doing the same thing. So generally what I like to do is in December, I like to kind of start winding things down. Now, I did this the very first year I had my podcast in 2009. It was my only full year that I did the show. Um, and I thought I would bring it back. So um, the first podcast I'm going to release in December is the Best of the Graveyard Show Podcast 2020. I know it kind of sounds weird putting the word best and 2020 in the same sentence. So I apologize for that. So the plan would be to highlight the uh, original, only the original interviews that I've done this year. So that would be starting from uh, Tombstone 17 with JG all the way up here to uh, David Weiner. Now, not only am I going to just focus on that, I'm also going to include some other uh, snippets that have not been released on any of the podcasts prior. So it's sort of a best of the interviews that I've done this year, along with some new original content that's kind of related to the interviews and some other just fun stuff that I just, I came across that I thought would be kind of nice to put on there as well. So that'll be the first podcast in December. And what's great too, is that for those of you who are just finding the show, uh, it gives you an idea uh, what the show's like, what the interviews are like, what I'm like. And uh, after that, uh, for the final podcast of 2020, I thought I would end uh, at the beginning. And by that, I mean, uh, I thought it'd be really kind of a cool idea to release the very first Graveyard Show podcast um, in its entirety, unedited, uh, from January 1st, 2009. That was the first Graveyard Show podcast that ever existed. And it's uh, the interview that I did with the co-writer and the director of the horror movie, Midnight Movie, Jack Messett. Jack was my very first guest on this program. So I thought it would be fun just to uh, re-air that in its entirety. So if you listen to the show uh, back then, uh, this is the entire show that you would have heard from beginning to end. So I thought that would be kind of fun to do. Uh, Again, just a nice little way to end the year. Again, uh, if you want to uh, reach out to this program, you want to uh, send me an email, please do so. GYSpodcast at gmail.com. G is in grave, Y is in yard, S is in show, podcast. GYSpodcast at gmail.com. The Graveyard Show podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, and everywhere podcasts exist. And as I mentioned, the show is also available on YouTube. Just look for Graveyard Show Podcast. And just recently, the Graveyard Show Podcast just joined the website podchaser.com. If you're not familiar with that, go check it out. It is uh, simple, podchaser.com. And you can uh, catch the show on there as well. And of course, if you know anyone who's a fan of horror, please invite them to enter the graveyard. New listeners and friends are always welcome. In the meantime, my friends, uh, stay safe, stay healthy, stay sane. I look forward to seeing you again here in the month of December. Uh, Enjoy the uh, rest of the month, my friends. And for all of uh, my listeners here in the States, uh, have a happy and safe Thanksgiving. Uh, I look forward to seeing everybody back here again in the month of December as we wrap up the year 2020. Cannot wait. And, uh, and as you exit the graveyard, I would like to remind you to please lock the gate behind you. We wouldn't want anyone to get out. Until next time.